Welcome to Big Thinking. My name is Gabriel Miller. I am the Executive Director of the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences, the voice of 90,000 professors and graduate students across Canada. Uh, to begin, on behalf of all of us, I would like to recognize and give thanks for being on unceded Algonquin territory this morning. Uh, I'd also just like to pause uh, for a, a second and um, acknowledge the, uh, the suffering that uh, many of our fellow citizens are feeling today uh, in Toronto and other parts of the country as a result of, of the events of yesterday. Um, uh, I know uh, it, it's a difficult time for many people and maybe we'll just, just pause for, for a second to, to acknowledge uh, what they're going through. Thank you. Um, this morning's talk will take place in English uh, with simultaneous interpretation available via cell phone. Si vous avez besoin d'interprétation simultanée, les détails se trouvent sur vos tables. Nous avons aussi beaucoup d'écouteurs à l'inscription. Je souhaite re remercier l'honorable Greg Fergus, notre député parrain de la série. We also want to thank, uh, as always, our great friends and partners at the Social Sciences and Research Council, uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, can't forget the humanities, uh, for their continued support of the Big Thinking series. And I also just want, before we uh, move to introducing our speaker, to say today may well be a momentous occasion, uh, not just because of uh, what promises to be a very interesting lecture, be, but because it is supposed to be our last big thinking in the parliament, parliamentary restaurant for quite some time um, because of planned renovations in parliament. Now, we will find out if those renovations start on time as scheduled and whether we really are looking for somewhere else to be in the fall. But right now, we, look, we uh, are looking for a new home starting in uh, October. And I do just want to stop and use this as a moment to say how much we appreciate the incredible support and service we have gotten over the years from the team here at the Parliamentary Restaurant. Uh, I always kind of stand up a little bit straighter and make sure that I've got my act a little bit more together whenever I come in here because the folks are so professional and so, for, so wonderful to deal with. And um, I look forward to being back with you in another decade uh, after the renovation is done <laughs> to resume our Big Thinking on the Hill series. But you can be sure it will continue elsewhere in Ottawa in the meantime. Um, now to the main event. Um, I uh, am going to actually invite um, a member of our board and a dear friend of the Federation of Humanities and Social Sciences, Julia Wright, uh, to introduce our speaker. Uh, Julia is a professor of English at Dalhousie University, a member of the Royal Society of Canada, and someone who has given hundreds of hours to the Federation and uh, to be a leader in the academic community in Canada. So uh, it's a great pleasure to have her here with us this morning. Julia, the mic is yours. Bonjour à tous. It's a pleasure to be with you today and to take part in the Big Thinking Lecture first thing in the morning. Um, wonderful setup here. Uh, the Federation is committed to mobilizing knowledge in the humanities and social sciences and to connecting scholars with policymakers, legislators, and practitioners. The Big Thinking Lecture series offers this opportunity for researchers and big thinkers to challenge and inspire policymakers, citizens, fellow academics, students, and community members on critical questions of our time. Today's lecture on gender gaps and de democratic participation brings up a timely question. What is the future of women in politics in Canada? This is a question that many of us have asked ourselves or even debated over coffee or drinks. Um, and Dr. Melanie Thomas is here with us today to help, us explain how, to help explain how Canada is faring in this sector and why women have been chronically underrepresented in political life. Her research expertise and policy insights will be valuable to us all. 
Dr. Thomas is Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Calgary. She researches the causes and consequences of gender-based political inequality in Canada and in other post-industrial democracies, with a particular focus on political attitudes and behavior. Her current projects include exploring the impact of gender on democratic participation, so she is examining such issues as the effects of gender, stereotypes in political engagement, the role of parenthood in politics, and the role electoral districts play in voter turnout, party competition, and representational diversity. Veuillez accueillir avec moi Melanie Thomas. Um, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here, um, especially because uh, it's not very frequent that I get to speak s for such a long period of time on my actual research. Academics know we spend most of our time teaching um, basics and foundations, and so to actually be able to spend a good amount of time talking about this particular project is, uh, is fantastic. Um, so. Uh, this is the title of the presentation, um, Gender Gaps in Democratic Participation, What Policy Insights We Can Glean from Research. Um, at this point, what I want to do is to thank the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council for their support of this work. Um, both of myself, I received uh, uh, support through the Canada Graduate Scholarship Program through both my master's and my doctoral uh, work. And then some of the work that I'm going to be presenting is also supported by the Shirk Insight Grant Program. Um, okay. The first thing I want to do is to talk about why we should care about gender. Uh, one of the things that comes through very clearly when I'm teaching this is that folks have a lot of assumptions about how gender structures politics, and many of those are incorrect. Um, for example, uh, on average, women do vote at a different rate than do men. Women are more likely to vote than are men, and they have been more likely to vote for quite some time, since about the 1970s. So women are about two to three percentage points more likely to turn out to vote uh, than are men, and that's been the case for quite some time. Uh, women vote for different parties than do men. Uh, Canada is a good example of something that has a modern gender gap, as in women are more likely to vote for parties of the left uh, compared to men. And so we see this usually in a gap between uh, in favor of women in terms of New Democrat voting and a gap in favor of men in terms of conservative voting. The explanation for this is gender structures, differences in values and beliefs, and that explains why that gap exists. Um, this also leads to the other thing where I think it gets lost in the, uh, how we think about public opinion and what structures public opinion in Canada. Uh, one of my colleagues, Cameron Anderson, published an article a few years ago identifying that between 1979 and 2006, gender strongly structured policy preferences. Um, gender differences in those policy preferences were greater than differences across income categories and across age groups. Um, those gender differences were about as large as differences across language groups and only slightly less important than differences across levels of education or region. So as somebody who's been a lifelong Albertan, um, it always shocks my students when they actually look at that particular table and I say, look at gender and look at how much, it, like, look at how much like, being from Alberta doesn't structure stuff, um, which is always a really fun thing to do in Calgary. But one of the things that's worth noting is that we don't talk about gender structuring politics in Canada the, the way that we do other things, like region. That's the obvious one. Think about gender structuring public opinion in much the same way and policy preferences because that's what the evidence suggests. So this leads to this particular question. So why, do women, why are women in Canada and throughout most of the democratic world so chronically underrepresented in politics? Uh, as of 2016, I haven't updated this based on more recent municipal elections, 26% uh, of members of parliament are women. Um, this, every election we have a, we have a slightly more, I, I, I struggle to get enthusiastic about the incremental change there. 28% of members of legislative assemblies, 26% of municipal councillors, and only 16% of mayors. One thing that we need to divest ourselves of the idea is that local politics is somehow more friendly to women than provincial or federal politics. Uh, there's research in the United States that says women are more likely to engage in local politics because the commute is easier, and I'm very sympathetic to that. Um, but this idea that somehow local politics is open to women in ways that other levels of government are is not correct. 
Um, women are only 38% of party members from the best estimates that we have, and about 40% of federal candidates. One of the things that's worth noting, though women are less likely to be members of a party, once they join, they are as active as our men in internal party democracy. So one thing to note for those who are on the party side of things, if you want to increase women in politics, sign up more members. Uh, because we know that once they're in your party, they, uh, they do internal party democracy work. Um, some of the things that we've seen to deal with women's underrepresentation come from government and from civil society. Um, you can see the government programs on the left and the civil society programs on the right. Uh, this is from the Alberta provincial government uh, program called Ready for Her, where it was a pretty intensive kind of online campaign school in anticipation of the 2017 municipal elections. Uh, the Status Women Canada, uh, I, looking at women's leadership and democratic participation program, is a little bit uh, older than that, but they've done some work as well. Um, Equal Voice is an entire civil society organization dedicated to electing more women, and I'll note the Federation of Canadian Municipalities also has had programs for quite some time suggesting that um, we need to support women who are wanting to run for office. All of this stuff is great, um, but the argument I'm going to make is that though this sort of stuff that's focusing on individual women that want to be candidates is necessary, it is insufficient, and I want to say shockingly insufficient, at addressing the gender gaps that we have in women's um, political representation. So, why are women so chronically underrepresented in politics? What's going on here? Uh, there are two areas I want to focus on. Um, one is supply, and this is where campaign schools address this. It's about the supply of women as potential candidates. So what's going on with individual women? What are some of the things that keep individual women from being willing to say, yes, I will be a candidate? Uh, the other is demand, though. What's going on with the system? What are the systematic barriers that are in place that prevent women, or that make this more challenging for women than for men. Uh, when we look at things like supply, we're talking about, I like to think of them as subjective self-evaluation. So when we ask people in the Canadian election study or public opinion surveys, how interested are you in politics? Generally, it's usually a zero to 10 scale. On average, men are more likely to say that they're more interested in politics than are women. It's not huge, but it's pretty consistent. It's about a 10 percentage point gaps. It's usually anywhere between 10 and 15 percentage points uh, of, yeah, men are more likely to say that they are interested in politics. Very interested in politics than are women. Uh, well, the reason why we care about this is that political interest, that subjective self-report of interest in politics, is a powerful motivator for participation. It's strongly associated with turning out, so strongly associated with turning out that people actually say turning out and saying you're interested in politics are basically the same thing. Um, I disagree because women vote more than do men, but they say that they're less interested, so there's a, yeah, so I, anyway. Um, but interest is a powerful motivator. It's kind of like you need to have it to be able to be willing to do a lot of political things. Um, efficacy, uh, here I mean internal political efficacy. This is the idea that it's a subjective self-evaluation. I have the ability to do politics. So some of the things that we look at would be when women are more likely to say that politics and government are too complicated for a person like them to understand, and it's that person like them part that gets that evaluation. We, this is, the, how to measure this best is really disputed in political science, and I don't want to get into that loads, but we, we try to change the measure saying, well, do you feel like you could campaign for somebody? Do you feel as though you could try to persuade somebody to your particular point of view? Uh, and though usually what comes through is that um, women are, they report feeling less confident in these political abilities um, than do men. Um, things to note about interest and efficacy. They don't change with things, they don't change over time. So the same interest gaps and the same efficacy gaps that we see now, we saw in 1965 when we first started getting our best reliable estimates on it. Uh, it's not structured by post-secondary education, it's not structured by income, it's not structured by jobs or occupation status, having children, processes of secularization, none of these big social things that occurred over the latter half of the 20th century move that gender gap. They certainly move levels of interest and efficacy, but it doesn't change the difference between women and men. Um, so this isn't simply about getting women to university or getting them into different jobs, like there's something else that's going on here. Um, same thing with ambition, political ambition. This is the idea that people actually explicitly state they have an ambition to have a political career. 
Uh, this is, a, we call this a rare event. Very few people, women and men alike, uh, report that this is something that they want to do. Maybe between 5 and 6% of people when we survey them say that this is something that, they're, that, that they are interested in doing. When we ask, would you ever consider, the numbers are a little bit higher. Uh, and this is one of the gender gaps that's hardest to move. It's difficult to come up with a way we can frame it in an experiment or in a survey that actually moves women's levels on this. And so there is some research from the United States where they say the problem is ambition. We just need to make women way more ambitious in politics, and that will, that will fix everything. I'm skeptical of this, in part because I know so many men are also not ambitious when it comes to politics. Like, that, it, this, it, to me, is not the most compelling explanation. One of the things that does come up that I want to say is not correct as well is this. This is a headline from a few years ago. Uh, National Post uh, headline is women, especially in Canada, are more ignorant of politics and current affairs than men, says UK Research. In the interest of full disclosure, this study was looking at the role of public broadcasters and how much people knew. And so they, it's a large cross-national comparative study. Not surprisingly, public broadcasters like the BBC and the NHK in Japan um, produce really well-informed publics. Um, the PBS is great for Downton Abbey, not so good uh, in terms of a model, for, in terms of political knowledge, and the CBC somehow falls in between. Uh, and they, when this came on the news this way, it was one of these things where they were saying, oh look, we're so surprised, there's this massive gender gap in political knowledge, and all of us who study this are like, we're not surprised, you designed your survey in a very particular way. Um, when we ask political knowledge questions, typically what comes forward is we're asking, who holds what particular position? Can you do the political pop quiz of who's who at the zoo? Um, when you add a don't know option, so you ask the political knowledge question, it's usually a multiple choice format, and you give a don't know escape, women take it. And so some estimates of the gender gap in political knowledge are as high as 40 percentage points, but that's because you let women say, I don't know. Um, men's propensity to guess is considerably greater than women's, on average. Um, <laughs> I actually, in my copious spare time in the summer, one of the papers I would like to write is how this gap is, we need to think really carefully about what we're trying to measure. If this is about knowing who's in what post, then, you know, if that's what we think political knowledge is, then yeah, there's a gap. But if you think political knowledge is about policy, as in, if I say, the number one question, do you know where's the best place to go to report if you think a child is being abused? Women get that question, right, like at a huge margin more than do men. I actually can't design a political knowledge test that looks at policy that produces any kind of gender gap. So I would say if political knowledge is about policy, then women are not more ignorant about politics or public affairs. And I would say if you want to persuade somebody to actually go and be a candidate, um, their knowledge of policy is going to be what matters more than, say, who happens to hold what particular ministry um, in... Uh, um, in a particular portfolio uh, at one level of government or another. I would note um, when this came out, my high school self, because of the incentives created by my social studies teachers, I, all, I could totally name everybody in cabinet to a person when I was like 15. Um, I can't now. I have a PhD in political science. Am I more ignorant of politics and public affairs now <laughs> than I was at 15? I don't think so. But. Um, anyway, so I don't think that political knowledge is, is what people might think it is as well. Okay, at the individual level, one of the things I want to talk about is uh, what the political system looks like structures supply. So my apologies for a very nerdy graph. This is like a super academic moment here. Um, on the, this is from Sweden. So this little red line that's at the top is women's self-reported political interest, the proportion of women who say that they are very interested in politics. The little blue line at the bottom is the proportion of women elected to Sweden's national legislature, the Riksdag. Um, you'll note it's very low until about the early 70s when Sweden's parties start using a voluntary party gender quota. They have list PR with open, uh, open lists. So it's a place where a voluntary party quota can be very effective. Uh, the point about this, um, this is from my dissertation research, uh, when you increase in Sweden the proportion of women elected to the Riksdag, the next election women report being considerably more interested in politics. It's a unidirectional relationship. One of the questions we always get is, well, is one of the reasons why women aren't elected because they're just not interested. Like, what do you solve first, the representation gap or the interest gap? This is 
for me, very persuasive. It's time order. We no normally never get time order without an experiment. This is time order with public opinion data. Um, electing more women in Sweden made women in Sweden more interested in politics. Literally, this election one, women got elected. Election two, more women were interested in politics. And so they marched up until they get to about equal. So and this is not to say that there isn't an interest gap in Swedish politics. There's a small one still, but it's one of the smallest ones on the planet, precisely because they see women doing politics. Politics is politicized in a way that makes gender relevant. Um, so one of the reasons, the, another way of looking at this is that role model effects are really powerful for individual women, uh, especially for girls. So there's other research that shows um, women are more interested in politics, they know more about politics when women are actually doing politics. So the logical conclusion from this is, okay, cool, if we wanna solve some of these individual level gender gaps, we just need to elect more women. So why don't we? Um, there's no evidence to suggest that women, Canadians aren't willing to vote for women. Uh, in fact, when we're looking out, if we're looking at real election data, we can find no evidence of gender bias from Canadians in terms of voting. Um, there literally is no evidence that voters are biased when we look at any kind of Canadian elections. This means that they are real candidates with real party labels running in a real election where you've got leaders and full campaign effects and it's the most generalizable context, there's no evidence that Canadian voters won't support women. Uh, in fact, in some elections, notably 1993, we all know how like exceptional the 1993 election was, but still in 1993, women were actually more likely to be elected than were men as candidates. Um, here, we're trying to figure out, well, what's the demand from women candidates then? Why, why don't we elect more women? Because if they were nominated in places they could win, they would win. So why aren't they? Um, so political parties. Um, there's a bit of a problem with parties in Canada. Uh, we know that women are less likely to be members of parties and that we know that women are less likely to be recruited as candidates um, in anything remotely close to the same number as men. Um, and notably, in some work I've done with my colleague Marc-Andre Baudet at uh, the University at Laval, um, women are far less likely than men to be nominated in districts uh, that their party can win. So we look at party support stability between 2004 and 2011. It was great for us, I can imagine it was frustrating on Parliament Hill with four elections between <laughs> 2004 and 2011, but for us we got multiple elections on the same electoral district boundaries, which matters if you want to look at things over time because you keep some things constant across a couple of elections. So we could figure out how stable a party support was. And we figured, you know, two elections out, if your party's support isn't changing across two elections, then you've got a really good idea if you're gonna win the seat in the third. You know, all other things being equal, make a couple of assumptions, but like everybody's kind of making those assumptions there. Um, every single party, except for the Bloc Québécois, and because I was publishing with somebody from Quebec, none of us could kind of explain what was going on with the Bloc, so hive off the Bloc for a moment. Every other party, <laughs> Uh, every other party nominated women at a far lower rate in seats that they could win. We call these party strongholds. Um, so, yeah, women just weren't nominated anything at anything close to men's rate in party strongholds. Um, I should note a plurality of all candidates in Canada are sacrificial lambs. They're never going to win. Uh, it's a plurality of men. It is a super majority of women. Every single party. Um, it holds for open seats as well. So if somebody wants to say, but incumbents, no, it holds for open seats. We see the exact same pattern. And if you want to say, but incumbents, it holds for women incumbents as well. So if we're looking at incumbents who are holding a seat where another party has considerable support in their district, um, that incumbent is far and away more likely to be a woman. Um, the uh, analogy I want to give here is that I want to talk about the Conservative Party of Canada. If they nominated women in safe seats at the same rate as men in 2011, 25% of the House of Commons would have been conservative women, literally women in the Conservative caucus. I don't want to talk so much about the other parties because in 2011 the NDP had very few strongholds and so if I was looking at that it would be like, well, build some strongholds and we'll see. And this is also where the Liberal Party of Canada support bottoms out. And we could see that there was a slow bleeding of partisans between 2004 bottoming out in 2011, and so I don't want to draw conclusions there, but, I mean, 2011, that was the conservative coalition for majority government. Women nominated in safe seats at the same rate of men would have given us one, like 25% of the House of Commons would have been conservative women alone. If you take away one number, this is the one I want you to take away. 
169. That is half of the House of Commons. That is the number any party who runs candidates from coast to coast to coast needs to nominate to nominate a gender balanced slate of candidates. Uh, this is the number for um, if you want the same number of women as men, you need 169 women, 169 men. Um, no individual level gap can explain why no political party has ever managed to do this. I don't think that you can say the gender gap in political ambition tells me why you can't find 169 women from coast to coast to coast. Uh, when I mention this, when I teach this, I'll say to my class, I said, do you think 169 women who are competent enough to be elected representatives exist in Canada? And they all look at me thinking this has got to be a trick question. Um, when I say, do you think that there are 169 women on campus today <laughs> who could fit this bill? They're like, yeah, because we have several thousand people on campus. The University of Calgary isn't too tiny. Um, so run the analogy provincially. Um, if I was to look at my home province in Alberta, we have um, 88 members of the legislature, 44 women in Alberta to run a parity slate. One party has managed this. That was the Alberta NDP in 2015. Uh, because Alberta doesn't change governments democratically very often, we have studied 2015 a lot, and one of the projects that I've done with this, one of the things I did was I would ask people who were organizers, so that parity slate, we usually don't see that very often, um, was there a quota? What was going on? And they said, no, it was just a commitment from the leader. The leader said, I'd really like to do this. I'd really like to commit to having a parity slate. And so the organizer said, okay. And they went and they ensured that they nominated a parity, parity slate of candidates. Now, I know Equal Voice has been asking federal parties to commit to this for quite some time. Um, I find it interesting uh, that only one party leader has managed it in Canadian history and it's only been at the subnational level. Uh, if I'm to look at my own city council, we would just need to elect seven women. We've never managed to do this. Calgary City Council is really strongly structured by gender. Um, so, yeah, I don't know why this is so hard. I mean, I, I know what organizers would tell me, women are more likely to say no. Um, women are, yeah, women are more likely to say no. And my reaction to that is like, okay, then spend more time trying to recruit them. Because if a woman says no three times, she probably says yes on the fourth, which means that you need to actually be organized to organize to get a parity slate. But anyway, 169, this should not be difficult. Why is it? And this brings me to the sexism portion of the talk. I'm really good at bringing a room down. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanna talk about sexism and I wanna talk about stereotypes and how they get manifested into politics. Um, when I'm talking about stereotypes, these are things that are widely held, fixed, oversimplified generalizations that you would draw about a group. Um, when we look at gender stereotypes, this is the idea that women are feminine, that they are emotional, that they are motherly and compassionate and sensitive and beautiful and warm and moral. Um, in fact, I had a colleague from the United States talking last night on Twitter, it was just a tweet, um, saying that uh, one of their colleagues in a meeting at a university said that, well, of course women are more nurturing and men are just better at the economy. And her comment was, could somebody please send me some blood pressure medication to deal with this? So like universities are clearly not immune. Um, this, I, so these stereotypes of like, of course, all women are nurturing. When my students want to talk about gender having effects, they will use the motherly nurturing children sorts of things. And I was like, cool, does that apply to women after menopause? Like, does, does that all go away when the moment that you get rid of that option, right? Like it's, it's a really narrow way of thinking about women's motivations. Leaving that aside, stereotypes about politicians. Politicians are educated, competitive, they're well-spoken, they are ambitious, they are leaders, they are charismatic, they are good on foreign policy. You can tell some of this research is from the US. Um, when we look at how gender stereotypes and politician stereotypes interact, the stereotype of a male politician is basically what I just said, you know, leader, competitive, educated. Um, for women, it's nothing good. Um, they get, they're cold. Uh, they lack compassion. All the good things about the gender stereotype about women goes away the mo moment a woman is in politics, and all the good things about being a politician goes away the moment the politician is a woman. Um, and also looking in the United States, one of the stereotypes about women is that they are left or liberal, which is really quite damaging for Republican women because in primary contests they face scrutiny um, that others don't. Note that because that's a nomination process. So why does this feed into sexism? Uh, the stereotypes that women are more moral, compassionate, and emotional than men feeds into something called benevolent sexism, the idea that women are too pure 
for politics, too moral for politics, too smart to bother with politics. They should be rescued on a pedestal. Um, conversely, the stereotype that women are somehow incompetent, unable to handle power, uh, not good leaders, we call this hostile sexism. Um, this is the idea of men naturally make better leaders. Women who complain uh, about trouble in the workplace exaggerate. Um, women want to get ahead by putting men down. Feminists are evil, all of that stuff. That's the more hostile side of things. Um, the point I want to make here is that stereotypes structure how we see things like gender and politics. And it structures this idea that politics ought to be a man's game. Acting on those stereotypes is where the sexism comes in. Um, so. How do we assess how uh, sexist Canadians are when it comes to politics? We've got this problem called social desirability. So nobody really wants to own to being sexist. So when we ask them about this explicitly, they all say, oh, I would totally support a woman. Um, the Americans have been saying this about a competent presidential candidate from their party since the early 90s, and yet we know that we've not elected a woman um, as a... Uh, uh, as president yet. So we can't ask about this straight on the nose. Instead, what we do is something called a list experiment. And so in the United States, in 2006, when they did this, in the anticipation of Hillary Clinton's first run to the Democratic primary, one of the things they found through a list experiment was that fully one in four Americans were either angered or upset by the idea of a woman serving as president. Think about that, that's a high bar. They were made angry by it. This fell down to about 11% by 2018, or 2016 rather, so this isn't, that wasn't necessarily as much of a factor when Clinton was actually the presidential candidate. Um, what we do with this is we have two groups, control group, experimental group, control group gets four statements, experimental group gets five, and we say, tell us how many of these statements you agree with. Um, I don't need to know which ones, just tell me which ones you agree with. Um, we design it so that we have one that everybody will agree with, one everybody disagrees with, and then one where we think people will split on the ideological spectrum. So ours are cooperation produces better public policy. We think everybody will support this. Uh, marijuana, we think people on the left will support that. Um, public safety, police accessing cell phones without a warrant, we think people on the right would be more likely to support that. And then the final statement, all politicians can be trusted to spend the public's money wisely. We thought no one would agree with that. Um, we have five statements where we wanted to see how many people um, adopted sexist views. So our experimental treatment, like everybody got these four, um, the experimental treatments get a fifth statement and the difference in the average of the number of statements that they tell us they agree with tells us rough, gives us an estimate about how many people endorse a sexist attitude. Um, men are naturally better leader, better at politics than women. One in five Canadians endorse this, one in 10 Americans. Women are too emotional for politics. Almost one in four Canadians endorse this, again, one in 10 Americans. Uh, women are too nice for politics, again, one in five, um, one in 10 in the United States. So I know we like to get in our high horse when we're looking at American politics these days, but um, yeah, we can't. One in five Canadians holds a sexist attitude about women in politics. We thought ho the H's and the S, this is hostile versus benevolent sexism. In our work, this doesn't um, behave any differently. The explicit sexists are explicit sexists. Um, the next thing that we did was we looked at implicit sexism. And so one of the things, um, as if you remember watching all the kerfuffle with Starbucks down in the south of the border, one of the things that they say that they're doing is they're doing implicit bias training. So this is the idea that people might be sexist, but, but they might not know it. Um, and so there's ways that I can go into the details of how we tested it. Um, we did this in English and French. We repeated that list experiment and got the same results. So we've replicated it, which makes us really confident in saying one in five Canadians are sexist. Um, here, we're li simply looking at stereotypically feminine names, stereotypically masculine names, um, political jobs and not political jobs. And we structure those jobs on um, basically how much prestige is associated with them. So we've got high and low status. Figuring out these where there were no gender cues in French was a challenge, I gotta say, but we did it. Um, things that come through very clearly, um, men don't endorse, um, don't have implicit sexism. That's not a thing that comes through only for women. Um, so women have somehow internalized some of these ideas about sexism in politics. Um, but it doesn't necessarily matter. It's explicit sexism. And I should say in Canada, explicit sexism. So this stuff, um, men are slightly more likely to endorse these ideas than women. Older folks more likely to endorse these ideas than younger folks. And aside from that, there's no differences. University education doesn't matter. 
Um, if you are on the political left or the political right, does it matter? Your partisanship doesn't matter. Um, we find this stuff all over the place. So Canadians can't get on their high horse about the Americans, but no party or partisan or part of the political system can get on their high horse about this either compared to somebody else. So what does this matter? Uh, the implicit sexism, it has a negative effect on women's ambition. And so if you've got a woman who's internalized sexism, she's probably not ever going to run for politics. It really, like numbers are already low, it really drives it down. But it's explicit sexism that leads people to not like a woman candidate, not implicit. There's nothing about implicit sexism. We, when we run this particular study, we've got a whole series of vignettes where we change nothing about the candidate but whether or not they've got a masculine or a feminine sounding name. Uh, and there's a major difference once um, the woman's name goes onto that candidate profile, um, but mostly from explicit sexism that drives that down. Uh, I, I'm happy to chat more about that. I am running out of time. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is how the media plays into this. Um, we have a project I want to talk briefly about where we're looking at the first year of coverage for a series of heads of government. These would be premiers. We have enough of them that we can study now. So we've got six premiers who are women, six premiers who are men. We have almost 12,000 news stories. The highlights are that as premiers, women get more coverage in terms of stories that, oh no, men get more coverage in terms of stories than do women. This is really interesting, Jim Prentice versus Rachel Notley. Jim Prentice was uh, in office for nine months. Rachel Notley, first time we've changed from the PCs since before I was born, since my dad immigrated, basically. Um, he, she got fewer stories in her first year than Jim Prentice did in nine months, as head of government in that context. Um, it holds for Christy Clark and Gordon Campbell and Kathleen Wynne, um, Dalton McGinty, those are other pairs as well. Uh, there also is uh, condemnation. So the good news, we don't necessarily talk about women's appearance or the hair or the clothes quite as much as we used to in the past, but when we do, um, the tone is negative. So we take that as evidence that women are still condemned for their appearance in the press when it shows up. Um, for men, it's neutral. So at least we're talking about women's and men's appearance at the same rate, which is low, um, but the tone is neutral. Anyway, to conclude, these are the idea that sex stereotypes and sexism, they're held widely enough in Canada and they produce conditions to produce both the problems for supply and demand for women in politics. So the bottom line is this, if we want to deal with gender inequality in politics, um, we have to deal with sexism. That's the only way that we can address these particular policy solutions. Um, what are some of those policy solutions? And I'll be very quick to wrap up with this. Um, anything related to gender-based analysis plus inside the civil service, I would say is probably a good idea for a variety of reasons. If one is risk averse, um, doing the analysis to make sure that you don't end up in front of a human rights tribunal just strikes me as smart. Um, but actually looking at politics through the lens that they're going to get differences across sociodemographic diversity, not just gender, but across a whole bunch of other bits of sociodemographic diversity, just doing that work makes sense to me. Um, one of the other things to look at is where do we see if the government actually has the power to address these sorts of things, they should do something to mitigate stereotypes. Where this is pervasive is in the economy, particularly when it comes to the C-suite in corporate Canada. Surveys of corporate Canada and CEOs demonstrate that they see diversity through business sector lens. So we've got somebody from investment, somebody from somewhere else, so on and so forth, but they don't really see it in terms of sociodemographic diversity. Um, some countries mandate uh, quotas for boards. That's not my favorite policy. My favorite policy is one that simply says report and defend. Tell us how many women are there and defend your choice because I have a hypothesis. It's going to be quite difficult to defend the exclusion of people who are not white men um, from all posts like a lot of corporate boards do um, without actually relying on stereotypes. And if you make people write it out and shine a light on it, then you know, that might change the process. Um, there's a whole field on party quotas. I will be the one to say very shortly that I don't think that they are the easiest fit for our particular system, in part because there's no sanction for missing them. Um, I do really like the idea of tying it back to the kind of money that parties get back from the public purse, though election reimbursements are huge for political parties. Um, if you tie that to equity, every party would do it overnight. Um, I can't imagine that getting through the House of Commons, but <laughs> if you ask me. 
Um, the other things that have to do, this is the idea of stopping to normalize sexism, reflecting on language choices, assumptions, expectations, who get mentored, who doesn't. Um, actually sex sanctioning things like sexual harassment. Um, the number of students that I have in my classes that say that they've worked in various levels of government, including on Parliament Hill, and they have horrific stories about sexual harassment and sexual assault. And what's worst is not necessarily the incident themselves, I don't want to diminish those, but when they come and they say there was absolutely no place for me to go on that. Um, I can't do anything about that as their professor. I can't do anything about that when they're in my gender and politics class and actually can't handle the content because it's so triggering for them because they've got so much trauma from the kind of experiences they've had working in politics. That's something that you can do something about. Um, that would be great because from coast to coast to coast, literally, we all, we, we all talk about it when we have a student that comes to us and says, this happened to me while I was working in politics. I can't stay in your class because it's too hard for me to think about politics and gender terms precisely because of my experiences. On that depressing note, <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks so much for that, Melanie. Um, so uh, there is a microphone at the center of the room. We have a few minutes for questions. Veuillez utiliser le microphone au centre de la salle. And uh, please feel free to ask your questions in English or in French. If you could just identify yourself uh, before you ask your question and keep your questions short and to the point, it would be very much appreciated. I'll be quick. Thank you very much. Huge fan. I'm uh, Heather Sams from uh, Shirk. And I just had a quick question. Is it true that you yourself ran for politics in your early 20s? And so, could you shed some light? Thanks. That's yeah. It. Um, <laughs> uh, I did. Uh, it was before I received any shirt grants. And so the way that I, <laughs> the way that I pitch it is that um, I don't like the idea of a partisan lens being used on this particular work because I think because I'm an empiricist, and part of me is like, the evidence kind of speaks for itself. But I will say that um, after I graduated from my undergraduate degree, I took a job, like many people do, and I hated it, um, and was looking for reasons to leave the contract. And I happened to have a friend who was an organizer for a political party, and so I took the nomination to get out of a contract that I didn't like. <laughs> I'll be honest about it. Um, our goal was to get 10% of the vote, uh, and we missed it by 0.3% of a vote because 10% is the threshold for election reimbursements. All the parties know it. And so what we wanted was reimbursements. And so because it was also the first parliament uh, that was a minority government for quite some time, for decades, um, I agreed to be nominated again just because we didn't know when accountability to the House is going to come. Uh, and at that point, I discovered I don't have a good character for, um, yeah, for, I'm happy to chat like slightly off. Yeah, about why I think I don't have the temperament for it, but yeah, I did. Um, it's really hard work. This is the one thing I'll tell my students is that it's really easy to denigrate elected officials when you don't have an idea about just how much work they're being asked to do and the hours that they're asked to work, the commute, oof, the commute, seriously. There's, there's a number of things where, so I have a great deal of respect for people who choose to do this work, and I think if we start to talk about it as work, we will get a lot more purchase on how we see it in this context, for sure. Um, <clears throat> my name is Rule Amder, and I write for the West Quebec Post. Uh, one thing that you haven't discussed was is the role of social policy in encouragement of women to take part in these things. I think in the Scandinavian countries, for example, the fact that uh, uh, there are all kinds of uh, programs to promote men taking feminine roles and um, uh, giving women more opportunities. Uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. It doesn't change the antecedents to participation. Yeah, so uh, the research, so where I have the best evidence is to talk about how um, having a gender quota, having paid uh, maternity and parental leave, having a system of childcare, having a tax structure that 
incentivizes families to not have a large single income while somebody stays at home and instead is a more about incentivizing both partners in a, in a family working. Um, and none of those policies actually feed into the key antecedents to participation. So interest, this idea of confidence, this idea of political ambition. Um, and the reason why is in order for policy to matter, it, it's a pretty high bar. People need to be aware of it and then use it um, to motivate their politics. Now, a lot of people will do this individually for partisan preferences and stuff like this, but if we actually want to talk about getting women more engaged with politics, the number one thing I would go back to is electing women actually does it. So here you've got stars on electing women. The interaction here that basically doesn't do much for men, but it does a lot of stuff for women. Don't get me wrong. I think those policies are fantastic for a whole bunch of other reasons because they do promote equality. Um, it, I mean, the idea that fathers may want to spend time with their children when they are small strikes me as, I don't know why that's radical. Like, I think that, I, I'm always confused why that is so much more of a difficult thing to propose. Like, and it works in the Swedish case. Same thing with childcare, there's economic arguments for it. Um, but in terms of using those policies to motivate women to get into politics, the evidence pretty, is pretty weak on that. So I wouldn't use that as the motivation to do those policies, I would do them for other reasons. Yeah. In, in the Scandinavian countries, women, play a larger role, do they not? Yeah, they have really effective quotas, though. Yeah, so I mean, if you're looking at Sweden, they started electing women meaningfully in 1973, and they didn't stop. We didn't at all, yeah. Sherry Graydon, Informed Opinions. I have two questions, both also about what would make a difference. One is, um, will having more women visible in the news media as experts, which is the mission of our organization, will that help? Because I keep claiming it will, and mm -hmm. I'm interested to hear what, what the data shows. And secondly, Kim Campbell has been advocating for years a dual, dual member riding situation, which used to exist in British Columbia, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering what you think about that. Um, so the caveat I'll put in this is that I took an informed opinion seminar when I was a postdoc, and I think it was one of the best things I have ever done. So thank you for your work, um, for sure. Um, now, first question. More visible More women. visible, yes, on expertise. Yeah, um, so the debate in political science roils on this one. And so academics, we have our own version of this where we say we want people to say no to manals, which is a panel of all men. Um, if you are on Twitter, um, there is a women also know stuff hashtag. And so women also know starts with women in political science being really frustrated about things where we just see a series of like guys talking about things like foreign policy. And we've got international relations in particular is very strongly structured by gender, except there are so many women scholars that do such amazing work. And so all of the evidence gives me a really good hypothesis to think that seeing women being experts matters, right? And we can see that with, especially for young women. So if young women see um, experts doing something, then they think, oh yeah, I can totally be that. There's no, because gender role socialization, I think it's getting more rigid and more, um, it's stronger than what it was when I was a kid. Like none of my stuff was coded pink ever. Um, all the Lego was primary colors, all these other sorts of things, the 80s, you know. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it is really important. And notably, one of the things that we ask is for our colleagues who are men, when they see that it's a panel full of, you know, only men, that one of them step aside and say, I think you need to rethink how you do this. We also need to do this when it comes to other forms of diversity like race and ethnicity, certainly. Um, even at the Canadian Political Science Association, we have a panel on public engagement, and a number of people have said, you know, engaging with the public is really different when you're not white. Um, as in, and my colleague Erin Tolley is one of the ones who's spoken about this. She studies race, um, but she's a white identified woman. And it was only when she had pieces about her research on race on the front page of the Toronto Star that she started to get really gross things. And she's like, it's interesting, it's not my gender. That's, my gender's constant, what varies is the content. So yeah, that's a bigger sort of thing. Dual member districts. Um, it could be interesting. Canadians tend to not like that. Um, where I would be more inclined to go would be with things that Sarah Childs has been writing about the Parliament in Westminster in the United Kingdom, where things like job sharing um, seem to make a lot of sense. As in, your party has like X number of seats for this particular committee. You could job share one of those. And so it makes it easier for somebody to go home and be with their family, to go and do constituency work, to go and do a whole bunch of other things. Those kind of things that make doing political work a little bit more flexible seem like they're easy fixes. And so 
Um, she has a whole list of things. The, the report is called The Good Parliament, and it's looking a lot at diversity, and many of the things that she proposes there, most of the public I don't think would be aware of, so you're not going to get public resistance to it. You'll get internal resistance for sure, but they seem like really effective solutions there. Yeah. Bonjour. Est-ce que je peux poser la question en français? Or I can try in English too. En français, c'est où? C'est okay. va en français. Yeah. Alors, vous avez parlé des quotas. Mm -hmm. euh, je suis d'accord avec le fait de mettre des quotas. Par contre, quand je parle à de jeunes femmes, et pourtant vous en êtes une et vous êtes d'accord avec les quotas, donc quand je parle avec des jeunes femmes, euh, habituellement, elles sont contre les mm -hmm. quotas. Et yeah. elles, donc, je me demande s'il n'y a pas un problème de génération là-dedans. I actually think it's a problem of age, because my younger self was totally opposed to quotas. And so this is when, it was when none of it was being formed. I was a new undergraduate, and Lisa Young had written the piece arguing for dual member districts, where one candidate would be a woman and one candidate would be a man. And I remember preparing to discuss it in class and being viscerally opposed and not being able to say why. And I think I came up with some kind of mealy mouth thing where it's just kind of like merit, blah. Um, <laughs> My older self is a lot saltier about it. Um, it's the, I have not seen anything that suggests that competence in politics is structured by gender, and even if it were, I would point to section three of the Constitution and says every Canadian has a right to stand for public office, which means that structuring how we do voting on whether or not somebody is shiny enough is kind of problematic for democracy in general. And so I look at quotas and I say, if that's the policy that we need to get people to actually like just get to 169, then I would do it um, because I have no patience for the inability to get to 169 or 44 or 7 or wherever I'm looking at. Um, though, my friend uh, Katrin Beauregard, she is a University of Calgary graduate, um, currently working at Australia National University. Um, one of the things that she finds is that quota support is often highest for people who also score really high on benevolent sexism. So it's not lost on me that the people who are like women, they're, they're beautiful and they're wonderful and on the pedestal they should go, are also the people that say, well, they couldn't get elected on their own, so the quota I will give them. But on somewhat like, yeah, I'm, I'm salty about that 169. Like it's just figure out what you need to do to get there and just get there. Like I have no patience for it anymore. Yeah. No. Hi, thank you for such a wonderful talk. I'm just wondering if there's been any, in your research, if you've looked at intersectionality as it applies to women and how that plays out in the political realm. Yeah, so we do a few things. Um, we try to get on the opinion stuff. We always have an option for folks who are non-binary in our gender identity, and we don't get a lot of take up on that. Um, and so the difficulty with a lot of this work is that we have a bad way of measuring gender diversity. Um, I've got colleagues, Amanda Bittner and Elizabeth Goodyear Grant, are doing really good work on um, how we could come up with a different measure that doesn't necessarily look at gender identity, but instead looks at conceptions of masculinity and femini femininity, because we think that's probably what's doing the work. Um, and a large number of people seem to report being okay with something that looks like the binary, but there's a bunch of people who don't, and we're missing out on that. Um, yeah, so the, we're, I'm watching to see what they do with their work next to see how we can best come up with different instruments. This, people in psychology have done it, but they have like very, very long um, batteries of questions that we can't, like we can't actually get them in a survey effectively. Um, for other things like race and diversity and things like this, um, for things like indigeneity, this is where I would defer to my colleagues who are indigenous and they will, they speak very forcefully about there's a forceful interaction between gender and indigenous status. Um, Gina Starblanket's work is some of the stuff that I find to be most engaging on that. Uh, and then on race and diversity, I will note um, on the election side of things, this is where Erin Tolley's work is really interesting. Every party, once uh, the number of electors in a district are majority non-white, every party somehow manages to find a candidate who's not white. The moment it's just just barely 50% white folks is the moment that all the candidates are white. So uh, in talking with some folks, one of the lines I got from an organizer was, well, we recruit on diversity where it matters. And one of the things I look at is the, well, it's really interesting who gets to decide where it matters and where it doesn't, right? Um, so, on, on, so on indigenous status and elections, this is one of those ones where that is, I defer to folks who talk about how that's fraught and the colonial institutions and things like this. But on other sorts of things, for, for settlers who are not white, like I, again, I share the same frustrations on this where it's a, I don't know why, 
I do know why their recruitment structures look like this, but I, I have no patience with them so much anymore. Hi, Karen Vecchio, Member of Parliament and also Chair of the Status of Women Sorry. Committee. And my analyst is sitting here and she's going to kill me. But uh, just to let you know, we are going to be starting in June. We're going to be doing a political study win with women in politics. Mm -hmm. So we are asking for briefs and Dominique by July 6th. So by July 6th, I'm just looking, so I'm doing an advertisement here, seeing what the room is filled with. So please, if you have anything to say on this topic, Status of Women will be studying it. Briefs are due by July 6th. Thanks. A number of women. We've had a number of women who have been elected premiers mm -hmm. in provinces and the territories, but there has been none re-elected. Uh, do you have any observations? I have an article looking at this because women also emerge into the premier's office um, through a different pathway. If you look at men, about half get through to become premier because they led a party that won a majority of seats and about half are first appointed premier because uh, they became party leader while their party was in government at some time between elections. For women, 75% of them get selected to be premier during an inter-election kind of thing. So only Pauline Marois and Rachel Notley have led, um, have become premier first through a general election process. Um, I can't find any evidence to suggest that parties were in decline when they selected women as um, leaders while they were in government. Uh, except for Kathleen Wynne. Kathleen Wynne, things look like that context was not so good. Um, but Christy Clark, uh, Alison Redford, I know people who know Alberta think that from where they sit in the armchair, that's not how that looked. But I like, can't find consistent evidence across, the, yeah, to show that those parties were already like going very much down the cliff. Kathy Dunderdale in um, Newfoundland and Labrador, yeah. So this is where I find that the stereotypes are probably going to be most forceful because um, they affect leader evaluations. And so if we think that a candidate's character or a candidate's competence is structured by their gender, which I think we have evidence to suggest that it is, that's going to matter an awful lot for when parties are led by women. We just haven't had enough to contest elections to be able to see what the effects are, which is, yeah. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Manny, a PhD student from the University of Ottawa, and uh, I, I loved your presentation, and I just had a couple of questions. Uh, in your research, I was wondering, well, in feminist scholarship, they've started discussing how women are now engaging more in informal politics, whether through organizations, volunteerism, and I was wondering if, A, you've noticed that in your own research, if you know they're moving away from formal politics and moving into formal, informal politics, and if this is the case, I was wondering why we are not defining informal politics as a legitimate form of political participation, and how can we reconcile the two if women are engaging more in the informal side instead of the formal side? So I would actually contend the change over time argument. I think women have always been doing informal politics. They've always been doing community organizing. They've always been doing things like anti-poverty work. Um, and it's that sort of thing, that, that community engagement that makes women good candidates. And so part of the issue is that women will come and will say, um, but the work I'm doing is so important. If I run for office, I'm being taken away from really important work. Uh, but I'll note, a lot of people when they say, well, what makes a good candidate, my students will say community engagement, right? And so I actually would say that there's nothing that needs to be reconciled. This is more a problem of organization than anything else. Yeah. Last question. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, Robert falconer led Member yeah. of Parliament for Winnipeg Centre. Um, I have a, a little difficulty understanding the intrinsic and ex extrinsic um, side you were ta discussing there and some of the um, perceptions of women concerning sexism and how they view themselves. Uh, and I was wondering if you could discuss that a little bit more and make it a little clearer for me. Right, so this is about explicit sexism versus implicit sexism. So this is the idea whether or not, if somebody is identified as an explicit sexist in this particular work, it's because they have explicitly endorsed um, one of these attitudes. So they'll actually come out and say, th they'll have been on this, side in terms of that list experiment that we did. So they won't necessarily come out and say, we won't ask them this on the nose, but they'll have endorsed um, these, these ideas. There's also Cecilia Mo um, down in the United States has an explicit sexism set of questions that we also ask, and so we'll use that. And so these are people who have actually indicated explicitly some kind of gender bias. Um, the implicit is the implicit association test. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Project Implicit. It was developed in the United States first, and it was initially about race. And so this is the idea of looking and matching as quickly as you can um, 
the group that is you're trying to figure out if you've got implicit bias against and the thing, the domain where you think that the bias actually exists. And so for us, what we ask people to do, the setup is like you press two keys as quickly as you can and you try not to make a mistake about whether or not you've got a political job or a gendered name or something along those lines. And you run through a sequence of this. And where the implicit sexism would come through or the implicit bias would be the taking a really long time once you see an association that seems like it doesn't match or in making mistakes. So this would be a when somebody says associate the political job and the female names, um, people would start to make a whole bunch of mistakes with that. Or they would, they would hesitate and they would pause and they would take time. And so especially the timing is what helps me understand it, where it's a, if there's bias, this is the idea that people struggle and they take time to sort things out because they're like, these things don't belong. These things just don't go together. Um, and yeah, this has been, this is not without its criticisms, certainly. Um, but it's the difference between people actually saying on a survey question or indicating, I think that women are not good leaders. I think men are naturally better at this versus somebody hesitating on an association and they're not necessarily conscious of what they're doing. And again, the whole, again, that's been critiqued being the unconscious bias thing. And I, our work slides on the same side as what many are saying about the whole Starbucks case where the problem is not the implicit bias, the problem is the explicit stuff. So yeah, I would come down and saying the implicit bias seems to be something that women s demonstrate, men don't, women demonstrate it. And when we look at how this affects women's behavior, it drives down their own levels of ambition. Everything else, all the negative effects about evaluating candidates and stuff like that, that's an explicit sexism thing. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, why do women? So the, so yeah. is it, is it learned throughout someone's life? Like as a father, so. you know, you yeah. spend lots of time with your little girl trying not to yeah. do that. So how do you actually then create so or, or build we, people that don't have that? We draw an analogy life? for that finding, and it, this is new, so I'm open to ideas about this, but our first shot of an explanation at it is that it's similar to uh, racial perceptions about fairness in the criminal justice system in the United States. When you look at white respondents in the US, they think the criminal justice system is fair. Um, African Americans uh, demonstrated that it wasn't, and they also had this kind of implicit, um, implicit thing that had gone on with that as well. And so we think this is more about a way of internalizing how bias is experienced. And so if you don't experience bias, you're not going to internalize it in the same way that folks do when they do experience bias. That's our, but like I say, this is new and I'm open to feedback because if that's not a satisfying explanation, then I would be happy to offer <laughs> a better one. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. Yeah, please, let's, let's thank Melanie. Stay right there. Okay. Um, you've really come and uh, put uh, some interesting and challenging questions in front of us uh, today. Being a man, I would have guessed I knew the answers to them, uh, but I would have guessed wrong, and it was really great to have someone here who knows what they're talking about. Uh, that part is so true. I yeah. just always laugh when, when I hear that about men. Um, I would have guessed it was the case. Uh, so uh, let me just say, um, I want to thank uh, Melanie, je, je remercie Melanie, uh, CRSH, uh, Greg Fergus, all of you for being here. Uh, I hope we get to spend one more breakfast in the uh, parliamentary restaurant together before we take Big Thinking to its new location. Uh, we do have a gift for Melanie, which I'm going to give you afterward because uh, we've had so many questions we need to, to wrap up. Uh, thank you very much. Um, stay tuned for information about our next Big Thinking. It will be in October 2018, location to be determined. In the meantime, we are preparing to be in Regina, Saskatchewan for the Congress of the Humanities and Social Sciences. The last week of May, it promises to be a fantastic week. And for the first time ever, we will have a Congress Big Thinking lineup made up exclusively of women speakers. And. Uh, Uh, we're very excited about that. So thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Have a wonderful day.